Hello everyone, Victor from OrganicChemistryTutor.com is here and in this video I want to talk about the intermolecular forces and how the 3D shape of a molecule affects them. So what are the intermolecular forces? The intermolecular forces are the weak forces that occur between the molecules uh, and they are not as strong as chemical bonds and they are not as permanent either so they can shift easily. So the first intermolecular force I want to talk about is the London dispersion force. This is a type of the interaction that occurs between two molecules when they approach each other and the electron clouds on the uh, atoms, they experience sort of like a slight polarization. So if I have, let's say, two molecules, then by themselves they're going to be completely neutral. However, once they start approaching each other, we're going to start developing a partial positive and a partial negative uh, charges in the electron clouds, and that brings together the interactive uh, uh, attraction between those two molecules, bringing them together, and that's what we're going to be calling London dispersion forces. And while dispersion forces are weak, they do actually scale with the molecular size and atomic weights. So bigger molecules can have a very large dispersion interactions merely due to their size or their weight. Here is an example where we have three different molecules with different molecular masses. In the first case, we have a very light molecule with the uh, molecular weight or the molecular mass, if you like, of only 16 grams per mole. Then we have hexane, which is a little bit bigger, uh, which weighs already 86 gram per mole. And finally, we have carbon tetrachloride, which weighs a uh, whopping over 150 grams per mole. And these molecules experience no other intermolecular molecular forces but the London dispersion. So looking at the boiling points of these molecules we can see that there is a relationship between the molecular mass and the boiling point. The very light molecule has a very low boiling point while the very heavy molecule has a very high boiling point over here. So overall, you can remember that whenever you have bigger molecules with heavier atoms or heavier molecules in general, they are going to have a much stronger London dispersion forces and they're going to be attracting to each other uh, stronger because of that. There is one other aspect of the dispersion forces we need to keep in mind. The linear molecules are generally more polarizable than the branched ones with the same molecular mass. So if we compare the neopentane, the molecule that I have over here on the left, uh, with the regular pentane, the one that I have over here on the right side, uh, we'll see that although they both have the exactly same molecular mass, because uh, both of them have uh, five carbons and uh, enough hydrogens around them, they are going to have drastically different boiling points. In the case of pentane, which is a linear molecule, we have a boiling point at 30, uh, 36 degrees, while for the neopentane, which is a branched molecule, we have a boiling point at 9.5 degrees, which is a much lower boiling point than for a pentane, and that is going to be a gas at uh, just regular room temperature. Normally, however, we'll only consider how linear or how branched the molecule is when everything else is the same or about the same. For instance, if you have a drastic difference between the molecular weights, then the fact that one molecule has more branches than the other one will have just a negligible effect. The next important intermolecular force is the dipole-dipole interaction. Unlike the London dispersion, uh, we see the dipole-dipole interaction where we have the permanent dipoles in the molecule. So in the case of the London dispersion, we had uh, dipoles only forming when the molecules approach each other. In this case, however, the molecules are going to be permanent dipoles whether they are next to each other or not. They are permanent dipoles. And because of that, they generate electromagnetic field around themselves. And we are going to see the uh, essentially electrostatic interaction between those molecules bringing them together giving you a group of molecules, maybe two, maybe three, maybe more, interacting with each other uh, via this electrostatic interaction and uh, essentially uh, clicking onto each other like little magnets, if you like. So what exactly are the permanent dipoles? 
We have a permanent dipole when we have polar bonds and those bonds are oriented in space in such a manner as not to cancel each other out. And since dipoles uh, put a partial positive charge and a partial negative charge on the opposite ends of the molecule or parts of molecule, they experience this uh, simple electrostatic interaction. So let me illustrate that with an example. Here I have a molecule of an acetaldehyde on the left and I have the uh, molecule of the carbon dioxide on the right. In the acetaldehyde example, I have the uh, CO double bond over here with a permanent dipole. We have a very significant uh, partial negative charge that we have on our oxygen and we have also very sizable positive charge on the carbon atom over here. So because of that, we constantly have a dipole moment oriented from carbon to the oxygen. And nothing needs to polarize this molecule, it is already a dipole. In comparison, the carbon dioxide molecule has two carbon oxygen double bonds that I have, one above and one below. But since the molecule uh, has the linear geometry, those bonds are pointing in the opposite directions. So while we have a significant minus charge on each of the oxygens, and we have a significant positive charge on the carbon, they cancel each other out, so overall the molecule is going to be uh, nonpolar. And we see that uh, difference uh, showing in the uh, boiling points right away. For the acetaldehyde, we have a boiling point of 20 degrees, while the carbon dioxide, as we know, it's a gas at a room temperature and it sublimes already at negative 78 degrees. So here is another interesting example that we commonly see on the exams. We have three molecules here with an increasing number of uh, carbon-chlorine bonds and the carbon-chlorine bond is going to be a polar bond, so potentially uh, these molecules can be polar. But let's look at the structure of those molecules in 3D and see if they are in fact polar molecules or not. Here in the first case where we have our methane molecule, we have four carbon-hydrogen bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds generally are not considered to be the polar bonds, that's why that molecule we can say that this is just a regular non-polar molecule. And as a non-polar molecule, it is not going to show any kind of dipole-dipole uh, interactions. The second molecule has two carbon-chlorine bonds, and since the structure of the molecule is tetrahedral, the molecular geometry is tetrahedral, we are going to see the dipoles coming from carbon to chlorine, looking like this, giving you a overall non-zero dipole moment in this molecule, oriented somewhere like that in this molecule. And finally, we have carbon tetrachloride, which has four carbon-chlorine bonds. But in this case, what is uh, extremely important that, again, due to the tetrahedral shape, all of those carbon-chlorine bonds, they are essentially going to be canceling each other. We have four dipole moments, and when those dipole moments all sum up, the overall dipole is going to be zero which means that our carbon tetrachloride is also going to be a nonpolar molecule, which means that only the uh, dichloromethane that we have in the middle going to be the only polar molecule, and that's going to be the only molecule that can have dipole-dipole interactions uh, out of these three examples. And finally, we get to the hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole interaction It's generally much stronger than most dipole-dipole interactions and it has a more complex nature than just a simple electrostatic attraction. The hydrogen bonding occurs when we have a hydrogen connected to nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine atoms and it interacts with an electron pair from another nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine atom. Here is the example that I have where in the first case I've got two molecules interacting with each other. And you can see that the hydrogen that I have on one of my OH groups interacting with the oxygen from the other molecule and that gives you your hydrogen bonding over here. 
Always remember that you absolutely must have hydrogen attached to the oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine, otherwise there are going to be no hydrogen bonding whatsoever. If we uh, look at our example to the right, for instance, here we have hydrogen in methane molecule, however, that hydrogen is connected to carbon, and since it's connected to carbon, it's not going to be polarized enough, so there will be absolutely no interaction between that hydrogen and possibly other oxygen that we may have in that system. So here is essentially a shortcut for you. If you are looking for hydrogen bonding, always look for the OH or NH groups. They can serve both as hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors. If, however, your molecule only has nitrogens or oxygens, but they are not connected to hydrogen atoms, then those can only serve as hydrogen bonding acceptors, so there will be no hydrogen bonding interaction in between those molecules. So, in the first case, what I have here, I have two molecules with the OH groups, so they can interact with each other, because uh, while one OH can serve as the hydrogen bond donor, another can serve as a hydrogen bond acceptor. In the second case, I do have molecule with the oxygens, however, it doesn't have any OHs or NH groups. So, these two molecules, they can only be acceptors of hydrogen bonding. So, if we have a pure sample of uh, this uh, cyclic molecule, which is, by the way, called tetrahydrofuran or THF, uh, we are not going to have any hydrogen bonding interaction within this pure sample of THF. So, when it comes to the exam questions, though, you're typically going to uh, have to rank the molecules according to their boiling points by looking at the molecular structure. So, here is an example of a lineup like that. And the very first thing that you want to check for is the molecular masses of your compounds. Generally, instructors will give you the molecules with similar masses already, so uh, they are not going to have a very different amount of the London dispersion interactions. However, I have seen a few examples where instructors threw a mean curved ball at students by giving them a completely non-polar yet massive molecule, uh, which ended up uh, with the highest boiling point. So always double check, you know, just in case. So, as I've mentioned before, uh, you're going to have London dispersion regardless. So, uh, and in this case, since the molecular masses of our compounds are close enough, uh, we can say that the London dispersion difference here is going to be negligible. Next, by checking for the polar bonds uh, and the dipole vectors which we potentially can have in our molecule, we see that we have a clearly non-polar molecule in the form of the cyclopentane, because here we have only carbons and all of those carbons are going to have non-polar bonds, so there are no dipoles. In the case of THF, we have dipoles pointing towards oxygen. In case of butanol, we have a dipole pointing towards oxygen as well. And in the case of butanol, we also have a dipole pointing towards oxygen, so all of those three molecules are going to be polar molecules. Finally, we want to check for the hydrogen bonding. While THF and butanol can be the acceptors of the hydrogen bonding, they cannot be the donors of it. So, uh, we won't have any hydrogen bonding in a pure sample of either of those molecules. Thus, we have a clear leader in the terms of the most intermolecular interactions. So, according to our analysis here, the molecule on the right, this butanol molecule, the alcohol, is uh, going to be the molecule with the highest boiling point. And by checking the values, we'll see that that is indeed correct. Now, you may be wondering why THF has a lower boiling point than butanol. So, THF is 66 degrees and butanol is 75 degrees, while they have the same intermolecular forces and exactly the same molecular mass. This is where the uh, molecular structure comes into play. In THF, we have oxygen in the band molecular geometry, which means that when we are thinking about the uh, vectors, for the uh, dipoles here, those two vectors are going to be pointing towards our oxygen, but since they are pointing to each other 
at an angle of about 190 degrees, they are going to be diminishing each other a little bit. However, in the case of a butanol, we have one strong vector going from carbon towards our oxygen and there is no competition between the dipole vectors here. So in this case, butanol is going to be more polar than THF and because of that, it's going to have a slightly higher boiling point than the THF molecule, although everything else is exactly the same. So, like with many types of questions and material in organic chemistry, practice makes it perfect here. So, make sure you work through a few of those ranking problems to get the skill ready for the next test or exam. And as always, thank you for watching, and if you like this tutorial, please tell your friends and classmates, and I'll see you next time!